Hospital Women's Society for starting this amazing initiative. Uh, inclusivity is something that's often overlooked as its absence is not always noted by the masses. However, uh, inclusivity is something that means the world to groups of people who may not identify as being part of the masses. Efforts like the one that the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society is making change the lives of people like me. Inclusivity is taking very small actions in your own life to better the experience of someone else by promoting belonging, positivity, and collaboration, which leads to big, diverse, and sometimes revolutionary ideas. And I want to applaud the initiative by the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society to, to make these steps. And I'm very excited to be a part of the changes that are occurring. Thanks for having me again. Well, thank you, Rin. Um, we as a women's society realize how important this is, and this is only the beginning. And we are so excited to see where the future takes the women's society, um, being inclusive to all. So before we get started with this evening's speakers, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. So this evening we have three speakers, Michelle and Shannon, who will be sharing their personal story, which I do recommend having tissue handy. One moment, my computer is gonna shut off. <laughs> um, and then we also have Ashley Perrin, a acupuncturist who um, focuses on Chinese med medicine and fertility. So we do ask that everyone um, keeps themselves muted and preferably with their video off, just so the speakers don't get um, distracted throughout the presentation. Um, we do ask that we keep all of our questions to the very end of the presentation, um, during Shannon and Michelle's at least. And Ashley has asked that you ask questions throughout her presentation because um, she wants to be, um, keep it as more, most engaging as possible. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Rebecca from Alberta Blue Cross to say a couple words. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rebecca. I'm our manager of community impact at Alberta Blue Cross. First off, I rarely get emotional um, when we're out in community. I had goosebumps just hearing Rin speak. I'm just so thankful for Rin's counsel. Uh, Rin came in and spoke at Alberta Blue Cross um, through Pride and spoke to our employees about inclusivity and um, just seeing how one talk can evolve into, um, into some change is just I'm overwhelmed, so thank you so much, Rin. Um, <laughs> um, what the health is about making topics that are taboo and often not talked about accessible and giving us all a space to feel comfortable talking about them. And that really extends beyond what I would say this room, it's a virtual room, beyond this room into our day-to-day -day lives. So I just wanna thank all the speakers for having us and the Lois Hole Women's Society for having us as a partner as well. We're really, really happy and thankful to be here. And the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and the Royal Alexander Hospital Foundation is grateful for Alberta Blue Cross because without partners like um, Alberta Blue Cross, we wouldn't be able to provide these free lecture series for everybody to attend both virtually and in person when it is again safe to do so. So we're gonna jump into tonight's presentations. So first up, I'm going to introduce Michelle. Michelle is an educator, a wife, and a mom. She loves being a parent, but she didn't love the journey that she had to take be to become one. It was a long and bumpy road, but she's beyond grateful that she was able to travel it. She hopes to share, oh, she hopes that sharing her experience with infertility will help someone else on their journey in family building, growth restriction, and the long-term impact on cardiovascular health for their mother and the child. Welcome and thank you, Michelle. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here tonight. I am really, really, really excited. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly here. All right, and hopefully everyone can see that. Um, thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I am incredibly grateful to the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and Alberta Blue Cross for this opportunity. Um, just to let you know, uh, um, my story is not a real happy one when it comes to fertility. Fertility was a big struggle for me and my husband, um, but it is a story that I definitely want to share. I don't want to sit back and be silent. I want um, my story to hopefully help someone else 
um, as they travel along their um, path with fertility. And uh, so I'm here to share that with you tonight and talk about a few of the things that helped me get through um, my really sad story because I want people to know that they can struggle with infertility um, and they can go through the hell that it is sometimes and come out the other side and survive and even thrive. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So my name is Michelle Weinhandel. I'm an educator. I'm a wife. I'm a Disney freak. Um, I'm a cat lady. And um, after a great deal of struggle, I am a mom. And so I'm here to share that with you tonight. Now, um, I want you to understand that when I went through my fertility uh, issues, I did not go through this alone, not by any means. I have a wonderful husband, I have an incredible family, and a lot of them are actually here uh, on this, the Zoom the presentation tonight. So thank you to my friends and family who joined me here tonight. Um, we uh, couldn't have done it without uh, our friends, our family, um, a plethora of doctors and professionals and therapists to help guide us along. And so this is something that I have definitely learned um, from my struggles with fertility is you can't do it alone. Um, so our journey began in 2011. We decided, okay, let's try this. Let's try to become parents. And so uh, we went off the pill and after a few months of, of trying, I noticed I stopped getting a period. Um, and, but I wasn't pregnant. So I went to the doctor to figure out, okay, what do I do? What happens now? And it turns out I wasn't ovulating. So my family doctor prescribed me Clomid and referred me to the fertility clinic, which at that time was the fertility clinic at the Royal Alec. And, um, it was a long wait. It was about a six month wait before I was able to get in, uh, and try to figure out what was going on. So in the meantime, we went through the Clomid treatments, which, um, just sort of turned me into a demon. They didn't really do much for me. <laughs> it was not a very pleasant, uh, pleasant experience on that. So we started or, or had my first visit at the, um, the fertility clinic in the fall of 2012. And after a great number of tests, I received a diagnosis uh, or diagnosis of non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, so uh, this uh, non-classic CAH uh, usually becomes apparent in late childhood or early adulthood and females with this may experience irregular or abstinent menstrual periods, which I did experience when I was quite young, but um, having been on birth control for so long, it never really became an issue. Um, facial hair, uh, a deep voice, and of course, infertility. So this is, you know, one of the ways, one of the reasons why I have such a lovely high soprano voice. Um, but um, these were all things that didn't, you know, it, it, you know, you get a wax now and then if you, if you have some unwanted facial hair. And I didn't really notice the absent periods because the birth control pill helped to regulate those. So I didn't really notice any of this until it came to the time that I wanted to become pregnant. Um, and so then with uh, the help of our um, endocrinologists at the fertility clinic in early 2013, after our very first uh, IUI, we were successful. We were pregnant and we, were we found out that we were having twins and we were so excited. We named them Tuck and Roll. So you may notice there the picture of those two little bugs. Those are tuck and roll from one of my favorite Disney movies, A Bug's Life. So we kind of had a geeky name and we were really excited about this. And, you know, uh, it never occurred to me that, that this, you know, wouldn't continue, that we weren't going to uh, have any problems. So um, we went in for a 12 week scan and uh, found out that our twins had stopped developing at around eight or nine weeks and it was heartbreaking. So in the May of 2013, um, I had a DNC to, uh, because my pregnancy had stopped. And so that was our first kind of ultimate high and crushing blow um, because we had been pregnant right away and like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. And then um, it had stopped and we lost our twins and we were just crushed. So that was a really, really, really hard lesson to learn. But again, I didn't really have any doubts that we couldn't do it again. We just kept going. So we went on with treatments and on and on and on and this began a long and very stressful journey into fertility treatments every month i would take medication to overstimulate uh, my ovaries 
And then I would go to the uh, fertility clinic and get internal ultrasounds to check the follicles and see, okay, are they ready to go? Are they overstimulated? And then I would take um, an injection to release eggs. And then it was all very romantic, but that's when we would get busy. So it was that, you know, not only that, but then we would also schedule an IUI. And we did this month after month after month and not a lot of them, you know, nothing took and it was very stressful. And it was uh, a long time of, of me sort of really, everything was the focus was on getting pregnant and, and doing this. And it was really, really, really hard. Um, I couldn't, I found it very hard to hang out with my friends who had small children or who were pregnant. Um, I found it really hard to do anything else in my life. We didn't travel during this time. We kind of gave up everything except baby making and it kind of took over my life, which was really hard. And that's when I started to see my wonderful therapist and thank goodness that there was a place that I could go and talk to her um, and, and, you know, and kind of have that place to, to relieve myself without that judgment. And so uh, we did about five or six IUIs in that time. And it was really, really, really hard. Um, but then we found at Christmas of 2012, we found out we were expecting again. And we were very, very, very excited. And we thought, okay, this is, this is going to be the one. This is it. And lo and behold, we found out we were having triplets. <laughs> yeah, that was a scary, <laughs> that was a scary time to figure that out. Um, I remember being at the first ultrasound with my sister-in-law and she was there when we found out. And the first thing I could think of was, how are we going to get these kids through college? I wasn't even thinking of how am I going to get through a pregnancy with triplets? Um, and because we are really geeky and we wanted to give these babies really strong names, when we found out we were having uh, two boys and a girl, we named them Loki. Uh, or, or two girls and a boy, sorry, we found that we named them Loki, Ripley, and Newt. And for those of you who are, you know, geeky fans, you'll know that Loki is from the Avengers movies and from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And Ripley and Newt are two of the toughest women from the Aliens movies. So we wanted to give them really, really tough names because we had been through that loss before. And so we went along and our babies were growing healthy and we got past the 12 week scan. We did the transnuchal scan and everything was going really well. They had healthy hearts, they were healthy babies. And we were so excited. And we started to do those things that you, you get excited for when you are pregnant. We made announcements, we bought three cribs, we did all of those things that you were supposed to do. And then just the worst day ever, at about 18 weeks, um, uh, I noticed a little bit of blood and we went to the ER and waited most of the night to find out that, um, uh, you know, everything seemed to be okay, but uh, they, they kept me in the hospital for observation just to kind of see what was going on. I was admitted um, to the lowest hole hospital on a Sunday evening. Um, my husband went home and about 2 a.m. my water broke. I called him back to be with me. And Loki, our little boy, was stillborn at around 3.30 a.m. And, uh, but it looked like Ripley and Newt, our girls, were gonna hang on. So the docs, they said I had a choice, that I could end the pregnancy now, or I could keep going. And, but if I did, I was to remain in bed and I was to remain in a Trendelenburg position, which is basically with my head down and my feet up for at least six more weeks. So of course I thought, yeah, okay, let's do it. Let's do that. Um, but it was about 12 hours later that my water broke again and um, Ripley and Newt were born. They only lived a uh, very few minutes. They were very little, but I know that they were tough and I know that they, I hope they felt love before um, their short time here. Um, again, we had the most incredible people helping us at the Lois Hole Hospital. The doctors and nurses were just absolutely incredible. Our families drove in from Saskatchewan and all the way from California to be with us. And I know that we couldn't have done it without them. And it was at that point where Todd and I, we knew that there would be no way that we could do this again. We couldn't go to the hospital and go home empty handed again. We never wanted to do that. So we said, screw it, we're not doing this anymore. We went to Iceland, we went and traveled, we did something we hadn't done in years and we just stopped everything that had to do with baby making. We were physically and mentally and emotionally done. And we just took some time for us. 
and did things that we hadn't done in a long time. And we had a wonderful time and we didn't think about anything that had to do with baby making. And it was a wonderful relief. Now, even though our fertility story was a very sad one, our family story is not. Um, we decided that, you know what, if we wanted to build a family, we need to do it in a different way. And so we went about, um, uh, we went about adopting our son, Jackson. He came to us on April 21st of 2016. He was born on March 6, 2013. So he was about three when he came to us. And here you see our first family pictures together. But that's a whole other presentation. I could go on about our adventure and adoption. But um, I can tell you that um, even though our fertility story was a sad one, it has definitely made me feel much um, more appreciative of where we are right now and how we got our family. And I'm so very thankful for my family, for my friends, for my husband, and for the fact that we were able to go through this and we, we now have our little boy. Um, we just got him in a different way. So um, thank you for letting me share my story. And um, you can feel free to connect with me at these spots if you wish and uh, leave some questions in the chat. But I really, really appreciate uh, you all giving me the time and the space to to share with my story with me to, or with you all tonight. Thank you. All right, the comments are flooding in and I can definitely relate to each and every one of them. So I've listened to this presentation of Michelle's before and I cried then and I'm crying now. So thank you again, Michelle, for sharing your story and being vulnerable with all of us this evening. And I know that many women go through this exact same thing. And though unfortunate, I'm glad that we have this community where we can share and talk about these things that are taboo and not very common to talk about. So I'm also going to lead into introducing Shannon, who is also going to share her story with fertility. So Shannon is a proud Edmontonian and founding member of the Lowell's Hall Hospital Women's Society. She is forever grateful for the support that she and her family had received through her journey through loss and fertility. She's joining us tonight to speak op openly about her journey and believes that the more we talk about this difficult subject, the better we, and, the better we understand the patient journey. Though continuing to do so in the future, we can work on normalizing this conversation around this topic. Welcome, Shannon. Hello, everyone. I am going to share my screen with you all. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm so pleased to be here to speak personally about my journey uh, with infertility. It's always hard to be vulnerable, but I think that that's when the really good things happen. So um, that's why I love these talks because they allow those topics to take center stage and really get a chance to dig into the topics. So in the fall of uh, 2009, September, uh, my husband and I decided to move forward with trying to start a family. And at the end of November, uh, we found out that we were expecting our daughter, Gala, who was born in the summer of pretty much a textbook pregnancy, except for the morning sickness uh, until the day she was born, but absolutely nothing complicated about the journey. And I know that what you're all thinking, this seems like a very strange way to start um, a conversation, but that's the thing I've learned through my journey is that Everyone's journey is so unique. I started actually with no awareness of infertility ever being an issue. So fast forward to uh, spring of 2013, and my husband and I decided um, we wanted to wait a few years to expand our family. It seemed right for us at the time. Uh, we had no reason to think otherwise, um, that the process wouldn't be easy again. Um, and 2013 uh, turned into 2014, so it took uh, a little more time uh, than we would have thought. Um, but in May of 2014, we found out we were pregnant. And this time, our world came crashing down. Uh, 
um, and we experienced our first miscarriage. Um, so something we never ever thought of until and so our journey um, took a different turn from there. And I crumbled and was thrust into a world, a scary world of pregnancy loss, um, devastated, confused, angry, so many emotions. Um, one of my favorite quotes is on the screen. Life is not measured by the number, but by the moments that you have from the way. And this pregnancy really winded me. And I used some of the resources through my work CAP. I saw my family physician, um, a naturopath that I see and was cleared medically to return to work. Um, and everyone just assumed I was off maybe for a routine surgery or something like that because of the time frame. And only a few close uh, coworkers really knew why I was away. So I didn't talk much about my loss from here. And um, I'm dealing with two screens here. Um, so I didn't talk much about my loss from there. And then we went on to experience. And this time it was at the three month mark in my pregnancy. So extremely um, challenging to, to go through. Um, we were, you know, like Michelle had alluded to, we were excited, we were ready to do announcements and, and that. So this pregnancy loss really um, paralyzed me um, and really just took me out uh, like a tsunami. My mental health took a really uh, big nosedive, um, depression, panic attacks, especially um, around babies, um, anyone with babies. Um, and I went to a really dark place for six months and um, I also needed a surgery this time around. And I remember thinking when we left the hospital, my husband and I, you know, no longer pregnant and you're supposed to leave the hospital feeling fixed or better. And I remember leaving the hospital feeling more broken than I ever had in my whole entire life. So I eventually came out the other side um, after numerous hours of counseling. Um, it actually included some visits to the Lois Hole Hospital, um, the amazing Patty Walker, who I believe is still there. Um, and six months away from my career as well. And it was strange to return to work um, as I wasn't, again, I wasn't open about what had happened. And I remember thinking, had I gone through a cancer journey, I would have returned to work, you know, as a warrior for overcoming illness. And instead I was still really trying to understand what I even needed to overcome because um, I was so confused and, you know, angry at why this was happening. And it just felt awkward and confusing. So with the acceptance of what was and a renewed hope of what could still be, I moved forward. And I'm a fixer uh, by nature. So I really always want to understand. And given my age, I was uh, 36 at the time. I pushed for testing and uh, my OBGYN ended up referring me to the regional Alex and uh, numerous tests, but um, the result was that my husband had Olympic quality sperm count, and I checked, and he was okay with me sharing that. Um, I thought he'd be embarrassed actually, but his next question was, "Do you remember what the count was?" So <laughs> I know I'm okay uh, sharing that. Um, but my uh, FSH score was really high. So me, on the other hand. I was of advanced maternal age and really hard to hear when you're 36 years old. Um, and you would think a high FSH score would be good. Um, it's a follicle stimulating hormone, but um, it basically meant that my ovarian I was losing my ovarian. So I was actually reproductively more like a 46 year old. So then I, by, by now it's December of 2000. And then we really had to move fast and, and decide what we were going to do. So we moved, decided to move forward with a combination of hormone therapy, close monitoring, um, and IUIs as well um, was our best course of action. action. So we uh, proceeded immediately um, to make sure that that was going to, to happen over the coming months. And the next five months were intense. I realized that thinking a little bit about it and other people I know that have gone through this journey and I know that some people go through it for, for years and years. 
I had a realization at the onset um, that it was not going to be a long-term game. It was exhausting. Um, we had immense hope though. So we, we continued along the journey. Um, and the month would kind of look like this. We would, you know, I'd make sure I was taking supplements. Uh, on day three, we'd visit the fertility clinic at the Royal Alex. Um, I would make sure I got there for six o'clock in the morning um, because it was first time to serve. So I the office on time, which I usually was able to do. Blood work, so much blood work. Looked good. We would start fertility meds, and then I'd continue monitoring. This was a day. I'm thankful now that actually, um, this was uh, a day where I was actually the first one at the clinic, which was a good day. Um, more blood work, monitoring, and um, this picture is actually one that I like to call I never thought I'd have in my um, because that's my husband's uh, egg. Uh, waiting for our IUI. And so if everything went well, that would be the stage that we would do in the month. And we went through three rounds of IUI over the course of five months. So we did this process over and over. Five months. Um, and the last one in May was uh, successful, um, but it wasn't sustainable. So um, we ended up miscarrying again. And it was odd because I was almost numb to the phone call at that point because I knew I couldn't do this forever. And um, we decided to take a break. We couldn't do it anymore. Um, I relate so much to Michelle saying we just needed to stop because it was so, it was all encompassing and consuming in our life. And so we stopped and um, took a break. And we were actually in utter shock because we were the cliche case of getting pregnant. And I don't, I still don't know if it was residual fertility meds. Um, we did it on our own. And so the following months were nerve wracking, every ultrasound, um, anxiety, I had panic attacks every time we went to get an ultrasound done. This was an element of PTSD that um, and we didn't even paint the nursery until I was seven months pregnant. And um, on top of all of that, we went through a really traumatic car accident um, when I was seven months pregnant as well. So um, I was monitored so much um, at the Lewis Hole Hospital and so very thankful for the care and for, for everything that, that happened until then. Um, because as a result of all of um, that and the car accident, I was actually placed on on bed rest. Um, I was due March 31st and on March 8th, 2017, which Michelle, I really together. Um, a Benson was born um, and he arrived on March 8th, 2017. So um, a really fitting day given the journey, I think. Um, so in the end, my story has a really positive ending, um, but I really, I wanted to come here tonight and really emphasize that there was a tremendous mental health journey behind the scenes through it all. And there was a lot of darkness. So I really thank everyone for listening to the journey um, and allowing me to share. It's an absolute uh, honor to be here. And um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing your story. Um, like Michelle, we know that it is not easy to be in a group setting sharing your story, especially virtually when you can't connect and see the faces in the room. But please know that we were all here connecting and you're going to make me cry. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for sharing your story. We really do appreciate it. Okay, I am now going to introduce Ashley. And her presentation will not be as emotional, I promise. <laughs> well, to get a break from the tears. So Ashley is a registered acupuncturist who specializes in fertility and women's health. She has worked in the health and wellness industry for 12 years and as a full-time clinic clinician acupuncturist since 2015. 
Ashley's introduction to health and wellness began when she was able to treat her own unexplained digestive symptoms with holistic remedies. And this led her to pursue five years of studies at Grant McEwen, where she studied holistic health and where she specialized in holistic nutrition, neurolinguistic programming, and acupressure. During her time at Grant McEwen, she acquired her diploma in acupuncture. A highlight of her um, acupuncture education was a trip to Beijing, China, where Ashley completed a three-week internship at the Beijing Hospital, Hospital of TCM. There, she witnessed the strength of a healthcare system which fully integrates modern medical practices with traditional Chinese medicine. It was a revelation to observe how Eastern and Western medicine complement one another and how, they each patient, how each patient benefits from the power of this synergy. This internship, paired with her years of clinical expert experience, contribute to her integrative approach to fertility and healthcare. Ashley's signature is her calm wisdom and gentle manner in the treatment room. She is not afraid to approach any subject with her clients and is known for truly caring for each individual person that she treats. Please help me in welcome Ashley. Hello everybody. I think you can hear me. I'm just sharing my screen right now. Let me just move this. Oh my goodness, it's weird not being able to see people in front of me. Um, I just want to move this down a little bit more here. Okay, first of all, thank you, Amber, for that introduction. And also the Lois Hole Women's, um, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and Alberta Blue Cross for hosting this event and having me speak here. To Michelle and Shannon, it's an honor to share this virtual stage with both of you. Fertility is a topic I love and care deeply about without having, without having um, really be, I just really want to see if someone can hear me talk or not because I hear the chat going. <laughs> I'm sorry. We can hear you fine, Ashley. It's perfect. Oh, good. Thanks, Amber. Chime in whenever someone is asking questions, too. <laughs> perfect. So, yes, I have not started trying to conceive in my life yet, but um, I have still been given so much by this topic that I've experienced in my life as well. Uh, however, it still leaves me speechless at times uh, because of the pain people experience, and it's massive and not uncommon. So when I started practicing, I didn't specialize in fertility. And the biggest reason why was because I knew that women would do anything to conceive and to have a child. And I didn't want to take advantage of that. But what was quickly becoming apparent to me when I would see women come into the clinic and have conversations with women who were trying to conceive was that I had information and I knew information from traditional Chinese medicine that would help out these people and that was applicable that was applicable and relevant for them to know and that they needed to know and so it quickly turned into a passion of mine without a doubt so i have to express my gratitude to have the privilege to learn and practice traditional chinese medicine this medicine has given me a career it has also been a catalyst for self-healing in my life as well and this definitely wouldn't be possible without uh, one of my mentors who might be on this call right now, who is my mentor when it comes to fertility. And this is Dr. Sabrina Suto. And Fertile Way Wellness, you see two logos up on this main screen. Body Rhythm Wellness is what I go by for my website, also my social media presence. Fertile Way Wellness is Dr. Sabrina Suto, and I'm affiliated with her as well. And so this woman just has knowledge and compassion that is boundless. And I met her first when she was teaching me acupressure in the holistic health program at Grant McEwen. And she was the first person in my life that gave me something of substance that I could really sink my teeth into that just was real. And so without her, fertility wouldn't mean what it does to me now. 
So the goal of my talk is to impart what I know onto you. And the traditional Chinese medicine language is certainly different than what you would hear if you go and see your family physician or your OB. And um, my hope is for you to be able to see yourself in this medicine instead of just something that, you know, it's nice, it exists, but I want it to feel relevant to each and every one of you. And uh, I hope what I have to say piques your curiosity. Okay, so next slide. So my intro. Traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture is uniquely suited to offer support and guidance in the treatment of fertility. The field of fertility is within the scope of practice and honors the depth this medicine encompasses. Traditional Chinese medicine widens the lens by which fertility is observed under. The focus isn't solely sperm and egg. The information available offers a multifaceted way of seeing, understanding, and relating to oneself. And oftentimes you may hear that acupuncture is spoken about in relation to uh, invigorating blood flow to the uterus, working with the nervous system. And if you haven't, these are common terms that you would hear. And um, I will be making mention of it, but that's not the reference point I'm going to be coming back to during this talk because when we use the language in traditional Chinese medicine, how it's intended to be used, it just, it's very poetic, first of all, and it also really captures the quality behind this medicine. And it's just, it really gets the point across a lot better than relating it to blood flow or nervous system communication. So let's see. Okay, here's what to expect from me tonight, everybody. I'm gonna start off with doing a little bit of a breathing exercise just for a couple minutes, just because I think it'd be a good thing for all of us right now. And then the next thing, I'm going to talk about is organ systems and I'm jumping into that first because I just can't help myself. It's one of my favorite things to talk about in traditional Chinese medicine. From there we're going to speak a little bit about creation and transformation and then I'm just going to touch on some gynecological conditions, diagnoses that we encounter with trying to conceive in traditional Chinese medicine. And depending on where we're at for time, and if you guys are sick of me or not, or if I've overwhelmed you, uh, I'll give a little bit of an overview about the menstrual cycle as it relates to Chinese medicine as well. So let's start off with this breathing exercise. And so wherever you are, I'm just gonna have you sit comfortably in your chair. Ideally, your feet are on the floor. If they're up in the air and you're comfy, please do not move. Just sit however feels good for you. And I just want you to take three breaths as normal or as comfortably as you would like to, no specific way whatsoever. Just breathing in and out. And three rounds like this. And next, I want you to visualize almost just the low back. And in the low back resides the kidneys. So you can almost visualize the left and the right kidney and this space in between. The space in between is very special in traditional Chinese medicine. This acupuncture point here is due for Ming men. This is also a gate of life. And this really houses the fire in our body that really warms and invigorates our kidneys and also related to adrenals. So as we breathe in, I'm going to have you inhale and send that breath to this space right in between the kidneys. Breathing in, feeling your breath land and stay in this space in the low back. That's a coveted area in traditional Chinese medicine. Just enjoying a few breaths like this. One more.
Good. And now you breathe in again, sending the breath as deep as you can down to do four, Ming Men, gate of life, that space in between the kidneys. And this time on the exhale, feel the air leave through the chest, the lungs. And whether or not, if it does or doesn't, can almost just imagine that the breath is leaving from the lungs. And so in Chinese medicine, the kidneys rule the inhale and the lungs rule the exhale. And so this is the relationship we're cultivating right now. Breathing in, sending the breath down to Ming Men. And the exhale coming out of the lungs. Breathing in to the low back and out to the lungs. Exaggerate the exhale a little bit longer and for our Final one, breathing in and out through the lungs and a little bit longer. And take a couple of breaths just to center yourself back into the room. So this dynamic between lungs and kidney, that's just one way in which we work in Chinese medicine, but uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Okay, on to the next. I like humor. So if I if I sound funnier, if, if I sound funny, honestly, I'm, I'm flattered, really. Okay, but on to organ systems. So the body is viewed as a relationship of organ systems that have physiological, mental, emotional, spiritual capacities. These relationships parallel the various systems in the body, i.e. endocrine, digestive, nervous system, musculoskeletal, lymphatic, and also our circadian rhythms. And so when I talk about organ systems, it's not to say that there's a problem with that particular organ system. It's to say in Chinese medicine, we have you know, various functions uh, related to particular organ systems. They're also related to elements, colors, times of years, flavors, like it's really quite vast. And so if I talk about an organ system, you know, um, being excessive or deficient, or you may know maybe this one is like really at the forefront for you. It's not to say that, you know, this is like an actual problem for you. It's the same Chinese medicine, this organ is just having a harder time managing some of its responsibilities. And so what I have laid out here um, in these five circles are the organs that we observe in Chinese medicine. And so right over here, we have heart paired with small intestine, pericardium with San Zhao, and this is the fire element, red, that it's affiliated with. Here we have spleen and stomach with yellow, earth element, lung, large intestine, white, this is metal element, kidney, urinary bladder, color affiliated with black, this is water, liver, gallbladder, affiliated with wood, this is green. Now, I, it, uh, it would take me much longer than 20 minutes to go through all of these. So I've picked three. I've picked three that I find I am always talking about uh, as it relates to fertility. And these three are heart and also liver and kidney. So we will continue. On to heart. So heart, it governs blood. So I've, there's many different functions that the heart is responsible for. I've chosen ones that I feel like are relevant when it comes to fertility. So governs blood. So the heart will direct blood to where it needs to go. And obviously this is also really important when we're thinking of the uterus because the uterus really works with blood as well. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about this diagram that I have on the right uh, when I get to the bottom of these points here. The second is that it rules sleep. So for people that have difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, as a practitioner, I'm thinking, okay, what's either irritating the heart or um, is there, you know, something just to do with the heart in general? So is it primary or secondary? The third one, emperor, empress of all emotions. So the heart um, 
it notices and it is affected by, by all emotions that we feel. In Chinese medicine, they don't make the discernment between an emotion being good or bad. It's, it's an emotion regardless and, and it experiences it all. And so the heart also has this connection to the uterus through this extra vessel that's called the bao mai. And so right over here on the right, so we have heart that governs blood, it's the monarch, it's the emperor, empress of all emotions, and it's directly related to the uterus. And we're working with fertility, a topic that has a lot of emotions involved, a lot. And um, so we're looking at heart, and I'll talk about, because I'm going to mention heart chi, heart blood, heart yin and yang. I'll talk about those like foundations a little bit later. But essentially, we want those qualities to be available by the heart so that it can really nourish the uterus. And, um, and also really have this like line of communication open. And the spiritual aspect of the heart is called Shen. And Laurie Yves Deschar, which is um, a TCM practitioner out of the United States, she has this beautiful analogy for Shen. And so the reason why I'm talking about Shen is um, because my dog is just coming to visit. Shen is um, the spiritual capacity of the heart. And it's essentially like birds in a nest. So the heart being the nest and the Shen are these birds. And so ideally the birds are hanging out, they have a home, they love the nest. We like get to be that home for these birds. But when something traumatic happens, parts of ourselves disassociate, especially with trauma, because feeling the amount of the trauma and the whole entirety of the experience can be too much for the spiritual aspect of our organ systems, especially Shen. So the birds leave the nest and all of a sudden it's harder for us to get through our difficult situation we're going through in life because we don't have access to this quality, this strength that helps us to get through things that are difficult in life. And this is why I wanted to bring up heart first, because when I think back on all of the experiences of um, what I've heard with people trying to conceive is trauma is so prevalent. It's so prevalent. And, um, you know, oftentimes when I'm speaking with women, there's no place for that to really be discussed, you know, like, but traditional Chinese medicine is so suited to offer support when it comes to, to this type of, uh, of experience as well. And so consciousness, Shen, the translation of Shen is also with consciousness as well. So it helps us to um, be able to see a situation clearly. Like there's also this capacity of like what we call opening our orifices, like our nose, our ears, our eyes, so that we can like allow what has happened to like be processed and so we can make sense of it all. And the emotion affiliated with the heart is happiness and joy. Okay. Great. Ashley, I'm gonna stop yeah. you. I have a question, Ashley. Yeah. All right. So are there any herbs known in TCM or acupuncture treatments to stimulate ovulation? Like, I'm going to butcher this. Oh, I'm, I'm on the chat. I see it. Okay. Clovaphine cyrate? I'm thinking yeah. around the lines of apparently healthy couples who have no unknown underlying medical conditions, but have unexplained infertility where ovulation is a problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aziz. Um, yeah, and so Clomid is like, you know, more the commonplace name that that drug goes by. And there are Chinese medicine herbs that definitely stimulate ovulation for sure but it's going to be different for everybody. And I'll talk a little bit about why this is different for everybody a little bit later on. I just wanna make note of it. And acupuncture points, certainly, there definitely are. And, uh, and yeah, like what Aziz is talking about is healthy couples who have no known underlying medical conditions. This is typically known as unexplained infertility. And I find this is truly an area where acupuncture shines quite well as well. 
Okay. All right, let me get going. Liver. So liver is another hot organ system in the world of Chinese medicine and fertility. So it's the first organ system that's impacted by stress. So when we're under stress, the liver feels it, tries to sort it out, figures out what to do with it. It also regulates the free flow of emotions. So it's ensuring that like not one emotion in particular is hanging around for too long. It's wanting things to wax and wane as we say in Chinese medicine. And another symptom is PMS. So even crying, crying is like the tears, like that fluid is affiliated with the liver. Irritability, frustration, think about prior to menstruation. These are so common. Uh, low abdomen cramping also really has to do with the liver. Change in bowel movements, like um, constipation, diarrhea. That's also really, we think of liver. Smooth and timely discharge of blood with the menstrual cycle is a big liver thing because the liver really holds blood. And um, so people who have irregular menstruation, we're looking at liver. The spiritual aspect of the liver is the hun. And the hun can almost be like restless at night. And um, this is because the liver has this tendency to be overactive. Look at these qualities I have at the last point here. Like the liver is the visionary. It has insight, it plans ahead, it accomplishes tasks, makes lists, it's the general, like it gets things done, it truly does. And so many of us like love to feel that way. And rightfully so, there's like a lot of good that comes with that as well. But there are other organ systems, there are other muscles, there are under ten other tendencies that we also really need to lean into as well. And so the liver waking up at one to 3 a.m. having vivid dreams can also really show that it's overactive. Okay, kidney. So kidney is the final organ system I'll talk about. Kidneys is your body's bank account for energy. I talked about in the visualization how it's related to the adrenals as well. Kidneys really rule reproduction, growth, and development. They're the origin of the menstrual cycle because kidneys are the origin of like yin and yang. And um, here are a couple other um, points that have to do specifically with fertility. For sake of time, I'll just talk on kidney yin and kidney yang. So kidney yin is about egg health. We're looking at estrogen. Kidney yang is progesterone. And the spiritual aspect is zhe. And so when deficient, the kidneys can access fear all too well, all too well. And when we can reinforce kidney chi, when we can consolidate it, and when we can um, break through these fear paradigms, we have access to trust. And so one of the best ways to also really consolidate our kidneys is also really focusing on being instead of doing, which is hard. It's much easier to follow some kind of nutritional program or take a supplement than to be instead of do. It just is, but it's step-by-step -step completely. And this brings me into creation and transformation. And this is the essence of fertility, quite literally what occurs when becoming pregnant. However, becoming pregnant is not the only expression of creation or transformation that we get to experience in life either. And this really brings me back to um, a conversation with Sabrina. And, um, and we were talking about, you know, when things get difficult in life and you feel like what you really want isn't going to happen, but you're trying so hard and you're doing everything to get there, but you're just not getting there. And, um, and this is when the time is to, and it's to not to forget about what your goal is, but it's just to see what else can help you along. And sometimes by having other things um, be available for you, it's like these invisible doors open that all of a sudden you're like, hey, I've got this now that can help me out with what I never thought I could find more help with. So when the outcome isn't being achieved or isn't becoming achieved, not only does this trigger feelings of I failed, I'm not good enough, or fear of not being able to have children, there's a roadblock. Trying to conceive has been the sole focus and has taken all available energy. And this is when additional pieces of ourselves can be recruited to offer support and assist with creation and transformation. When something becomes difficult, for example, we put all of our energy into what we want next for ourselves and it isn't happening. We've hit a roadblock. It's so hard in this place to see how the dream 
will ever come to fruition. So in order to yield available energy or support, we must look at what is consuming ours or resulting in us not having enough energy or support available. It's then advantageous to look at what other parts of ourselves have been ignored or would benefit from some attention. What I'm pretty much, it's coming down to, what am I aware of now on this journey that needs tending to? And here's a few points. Can be introducing, reintroducing a passion into life, experiencing more joy, pleasure in life, creating an intentional life that fosters what's of importance. This can be, you know, speaking your truth, love, honesty, and also recreating relationship with body, mind, and spirit that's rooted in love. A few more. Understanding our tendencies and limitations and learning to evolve them. Healing what we have consciously or unconsciously been hanging on to and how the past has left pain and transforming the effect it's had on us so we can experience more in life and also looking at how we see ourselves. And so even for me, this topic, the one that comes up for me when it relates to creation and transformation is even people pleasing. I have a very long history with being a people pleaser and eventually it got to the point where it was, am I happy? Am I doing what I want to be doing? And why am I prioritizing others ahead of myself? This is food for thought. This is food for thought. I want to check in on time briefly here with Amber. Yes, we have about six minutes left. Oh, lovely. Okay. Okay. Gynecological conditions and diagnoses encountered when trying to conceive. So this is to give some framework just so you um, have an idea in your mind when you're thinking fertility and acupuncture, like, oh, like what's under that scope? Like what does fit in there? The answer is pretty much anything. And so, and it's not to say that acupuncture is the one solution for what you're experiencing it's to say that this topic is understood in chinese medicine and it has something to offer and if it's interesting for you and if this is something you feel like you resonate with then this can definitely be a part of your team and something that can be an asset for you and so let's start on the left we're looking at regulating the menstrual cycle improving periods whether they're long irregular absent painful short we're wanting sufficient length of the follicular phase. We're wanting ovulation to be on time. We're looking at sustained temperatures in the luteal phase. With women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, cysts and fibroids, PMS, low libido, anorgasmia, difficulty having orgasms, and also when it comes to trying to conceive natural and artificial reprodu reproductive techniques, including IUI, IVF, frozen embryo transfer. We're looking at unexplained infertility, which I mentioned earlier, truly an area where acupuncture shines. Miscarriages, recurring pregnancy loss, improving sperm parameters, egg health, low estrogen progesterone, and high FSH. So let's talk about high FSH, especially since, since Shannon was talking about it earlier. And so when someone comes in and they have high FSH, uh, that's not where we start in Chinese medicine. We're wanting to figure out what is the origin of this high FSH and why did this come to be? So in Chinese medicine, we have something called root and branch. And so the branch is the symptom. It's what you come in with that is you're wanting attention. You're like That's the main thing you're wanting to focus on in the treatment. It's the manifestation of disharmony, what we say in Chinese medicine. And the root is the origin. So it's like, how did this start? And that's where we start because when we look at just symptoms, we can feel like we're chasing them and like it's overwhelming and why are there so many? But when we can boil down to like a few root causes, things feel manageable. So even like something like high FSH, you might hear an acupuncture say, oh, okay, then we're working with liver chi stagnation and kidney indeficiency, for example. And this really parallels Aziz's question about ovulation. Couples are ovulating for 
are not ovulating for different reasons, really. We could be looking at, okay, yeah, there is liver cheese stagnation happening when ovulation is supposed to be there for that catalyst that usually triggers ovulation isn't happening. Or we don't have sufficient blood and yin to really allow the progesterone to really dominate the second half of the menstrual cycle either. So this is the thing is there are answers in Chinese medicine, but they're not they're not really satisfied, satisfying for our Western minds because it's not like one for everybody. It's, oh, like, okay, let's figure out what mine is. And so in a way that is satisfying too, because you get to really learn something more about yourself that you wouldn't have had the opportunity to otherwise. Okay, I really don't think we're gonna get to this part. Um, there so needs to be like a part two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> and beyond I feel like but when I talk about blood and yin these are a couple types of like qualities you can keep in mind blood and yin are also really affiliated with estrogen in Chinese medicine and yang is really affiliated with progesterone and qi is like qi is immaterial in Chinese medicine qi is like what flows with blood in our veins that keeps blood moving and warm and it's this trans transformative force that like allows change to happen in the body. Qi is like, it's very special to us acupuncturists, very special. And this is just an idea of as it relates to the menstrual cycle. And so this is a framework, this is not person to person specific, which is why I wanted to lead with organ systems first, because I hope there was one organ system that stood out to you to be like, Ooh, liver, like I'm definitely a go-getter. I'm always on the go. I don't stop or sleeping, eek, that's my thing. I wish I could like have a little bit more support with me throughout the day. Whereas this is this is general information about the menstrual cycle as it relates to TCM. So you're starting at day one, day one's when you get your period, obviously very focused on blood. This is also the follicular phase, the first 14 days of your period, which is related to estrogen. You're going to ideally ovulate halfway through your cycle. The second half is progesterone dominated and um, is affiliated with qi and yang. And I love this quote. So our Tao, the way, it's recognizing the path and knowing which way to go. And, and to me, this really reminds me of Michelle and what she was talking about earlier. It's like, you, you don't know what you're stepping into and where this is going to take you. And damn, instead of a path, it feels like a fight, honestly, some days. And, uh, but when we can have different aspects of ourself recruited and tap into them, we get the, we unlock these invisible doors. And we're able to have more allies on our side that we've cultivated ourselves. And at the end of the day, we're the ones who know our story better than anybody. So what a gift it is to have. And that's my presentation. And so Body Rhythm Wellness, like I mentioned, this is my website, my social media, my email right there. Fertile Way Wellness is who I'm affiliated with. Oh, so thankfully. Um, I'm honored to still work with my mentor to this day and wellness on white is the clinic that I practice at. All right. Thank you, Ashley. I know a question came through about sharing your information. So I did wait cause I had a feeling it would be on your last slide. Yeah. So, uh, here is her information. So if you guys want to take a picture of this screenshot it, I will let her keep it up for a couple seconds before we jump into questions. I would love to see some like yeses and nos in the chat about what you guys thought of this. If I'm like the crazy Chinese medicine lady or if it was overwhelming. Yes. Um, I was oh. going to say something about the chat. Um, this is our third time doing a virtual event and this is by far the most active and supportive the chat has been. And it's just been really heartwarming to see everybody connect and continue to um, continue that conversation past um, presenters. So I will now ask if anybody has questions for Michelle, Shannon, Ashley, please either ask them in the chat, um, ask them to me directly. You can raise your hand if you want to come onto video, you're more than welcome to do so. 
we just kind of want the next 10 minutes or so to be really engaging and to answer any questions that we may have. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, Ashley? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move this. Perfect. No questions coming in yet. Just, oh, perfect. Oh, all the questions now. Okay. How often could or should you get acupuncture during a cycle? Oh, I love this. Everybody, every acupuncturist will have a different, um, a different answer. Truthfully, I see clients um, every two weeks is how often I see clients typically at the beginning and then I can um, I spread things out after that but the approach that I really like to work with um, due to the mentorship I have is that clients are active roles when it comes to fertility and so um, by I avoid people coming in every five days because you know in those treatments we're talking about what things are relevant for you and what things you're gonna do when you're not seeing me on my treatment table and and I like to have people be an active role in what's going on. And this also includes maybe seeing other practitioners too from other modalities to like form a complementary picture. I don't just do solely acupuncture every third day with people. I do like to see people every two weeks and that's my preference at the beginning and we can space things out after that. But if you're starting, I would say start coming if you're like, okay, I wanna you know, get into this, do before or after ovulation for your first treatment. All right, so many questions for you, Ashley. You guys, if you have questions for Michelle and Shannon about their stories, or if you can relate, please put them into the chat. Um, we do definitely want to create a safe space for everyone to talk about their journey. Um, but the next question for Ashley is, can you boost your fertility with certain foods? For sure. So we look at the energetics of food in traditional Chinese medicine. And so as a general blanket, when it comes to food, we're looking at foods that are warm, and cooked are like your go-tos especially now that we're in fall so we're heading into yin months right now so right now think like soups squashes miso soup um break out the slow cookers ginger chai tea like these types of flavors that like warm and invigorate chi like this is what we want to have going on red foods are also really fantastic like beets and we're looking at um, like bone broth is also really great. So we're simplifying nutrition big time. Okay, I don't know what this question related to, so I apologize, but it said, can this help with hormone levels and lack of libido? Yes. Okay, perfect. And are there certain herbs and foods to be avoided during menstruation, regardless of whether you're trying to conceive or not conceive? Well, I would say, um, I would say to avoid what we would call like um, damp or heat forming foods in Chinese medicine. And this, so damp forming foods, um, are unfortunately are like sugar and ice cream, which, um, you know, a lot of people, including me, like definitely get on our minds, like when it comes to having your period, but it, it just is not, it's not what we need. Like we want, we, again, simplify it back down, especially if you're someone who gets cramps or pain, like just go back to simple foods, like cut out the treats. <laughs> or any alcohol. Alcohol is a big no in Chinese medicine with a period. I know. <laughs> I'm really disappointed about the ice cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, oh, my dogs just kind of get the hairball every once in a while. Okay, so what is the deal with seeds? How do they help with your period? Yes, so there are four seeds. Um, you can find them easy enough on Google. There's like flax, pumpkin, sesame, and I forget the four. Sunflower maybe? I think sunflower. Anyways, the idea is two of them are really good at promoting the balance of estrogen in the body and the other two are really good at promoting progesterone. So you have them at, so the ones that are good for estrogen, you consume in the first 14 days of your cycle and the ones that are good for progesterone you consume in days like 14 to 28 the second half because you're hopefully then influencing those hormones that are supposed to be present at that time in the body oh, this is interesting mm -hmm. um is there any recommendations for speed mobility um oh sperm sorry not speed sure. 
sperm mobility, <laughs> um, husband will not consider acupuncture or supplements and she has to be sneaky. Yeah. That's tough because um, supplements are, are good ones. Uh, I'm thinking there's like this, I'd have to see them. I'd have to see them because I'd want to know, okay, is this like an excessive case, a deficiency case, what's going on? Um, and just know, even if someone is shy of needles, like we don't have to do acupuncture during your appointment, truthfully. Like we can talk, we can, I can give you insight to traditional Chinese medicine. We can like understand what's going on and like figure out something that works. I'm sure you've probably heard of like the maccas, the zincs, and these kinds of things of the world. And, you know, when it's just dose based off of a shelf, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Does anybody have any other questions for any of our speakers tonight? I do kind of, um, I'm curious, Ashley, do you have any clients that come like as a couple? Like if you treat both female and male, do they come together? Is it beneficial? I have, so I've done a lot of like new to acupuncture initial it takes that come like the husband and wife together and and I always really do enjoy that to be honest because you get to meet the whole couple and um even if it's wife and wife like wanting to get pregnant and using a sperm donor coming in to meet them both that is fantastic like you're meeting every partner in this relationship and getting to meet them and get a sense of them and but yes I do see both partners in a relationship for acupuncture and, and meet to me that's been the most successful i really appreciate your inclusivity ashley it makes me feel bad for asking husband and wife so i apologize oh no, don't worry about it don't Thank worry about you. it um i am still learning as well um at your appointments do you just do acupuncture or do you do tcm suggestion treatments as well and someone asked what tcm is but someone is answering them in the chat for them <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't just do acupuncture. So uh, I think you've gathered I'm a big talker. Um, we talk. There's slide cupping I usually always start with. And then there's shiatsu, also twina, which are just like Chinese and Japanese forms of body work. Uh, there's tuning forks. Um, yeah. So acupuncture is a modality in traditional Chinese medicine, but I'm always speaking and educating and um, herbs are certainly a part of it. I didn't have formal training in herbs. However, I like taught myself Western herbs and I teach myself Chinese herbs. And, but I also have resources that are so fantastic for herbs. So I refer out when needed. Amazing. There's lots of comments, Ashley, of past clients and obviously Sabrina, your mentor and people um, who come see you guys. So thank you guys for all of your comments, even though they aren't questions, we do appreciate them. Um, before we wrap up, I'll give kind of a couple more seconds if there's any more questions coming in. We do have a couple more minutes. Michelle or Shannon, is there anything that you guys think that you miss in your presentation that you want to share right now? I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here tonight and for listening. Um, I, I'm not good at being silent and so <laughs> want infertility to continue to be a silent struggle for so many people it really shouldn't be and so thank you for giving us a venue to 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 share this so thanks to everyone who listened yes 100 percent. and i apologize because i realized my mic was cutting in and out through mine so i hope it was i hope it wasn't too uh there weren't too many words lost but i i'm with michelle um having a platform to talk and um to share uh it's something that's not talked about and the only way we can bring awareness is to talk more so thank you yes and what i do what i do means nothing it means nothing without women like you two michelle and shannon seriously so i appreciate you both so much and on that note from the women's society uh and the Alberta Blue, Claw, Alberta Blue Cross. We are so thankful that all of you guys were able to attend this evening's um, talk. And to all of our speakers, I know it wasn't easy to share your story. So thank you again. Um, please everybody stay connected with Michelle, Shannon and Ashley um, post um, tonight's event. 
Um, and I will be, uh, I, it has been recorded, so I will be sharing that on YouTube early next week. So if anybody missed it, or if you know of anybody that could have benefited from tonight, please share that. Um, and again, Alberta Blue Cross, without you guys, um, this would not be possible. So again, thank you for your community partnership. Um, our next What the Health series is on October 21st, and the topic is emergency cardiovascular um, health and stress. And I know that it is going to be engaging. I know the speaker is here um, tonight, so thank you for tuning in, Mike. Um, but that registration will be opening up really short, uh, really shortly. So thank you again to everybody. Um, if you have any questions, I will stay on for the next kind of five minutes while everyone kind of leaves. But until then, thank you and see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Is what I always call the awkward goodbye awkward goodbyes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. They're dropping like flies now, ladies. <laughs> Have a good night. Hi Lisa. Hi. Bye. Hi Lisa. Hi. Thanks, Lisa. Bye. Great job, girls. Thank you. That's my wonderful sister-in-law. <laughs> She's also the new co-chair of the Women's Society. She's such April. a rock star, isn't she? Oh, yeah. Oh, I hope to hang out with you ladies again. This was so nice. <laughs> you know what? This was really amazing. So yeah, again, thank you so much for, for this. It was really exciting. I'm kind of buzzing now. It's going to take me some yeah. time because I'm excited, but it was really yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. feels good to share and to just doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It yeah, it really yeah. does. And for people, it's to a bit of a release for <laughs> to yes. share the story. Absolutely. I, yeah, you know, and and yeah. and I I I didn't think it would be because I mean yeah. it's been a long time. So yeah, me too. You know, we've kind of gone through this, but yeah, you know, um, talking about it again and understanding that you know, like that there's still people going through this and yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I'm seeing, Amber, I'm seeing a few questions on the Royal Alex still seeing patients. Yeah, um, they it's, are. It's, yeah. The, oh, they are seeing? Are they? Yeah, I'm, Dr. I thought, and clients. Oh, okay. okay. So maybe they are still. I thought it was just the private clinic. Um, you know, for the longest time, it was. Like, I've only just heard of the Royal Alex clinic resurface, I would say, in the past six months. Oh, Okay. I noticed there's one from Karen Sweet, and I think she's still looks like she's still on the line. And uh, I personally do not want to speak to that topic because I do not. Yeah. Know I don't know. Yeah. But I can definitely um, find out for you, Karen, and um, get back to you. Yeah, Karen. So the only one I know of is Dr. Motan that's still at the Royal Alec because oh. Dr. Motan. Same no. here. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I remember Dr. Motan. <laughs> He was the only name I liked him. when I first started out practicing. Like everyone had Dr. Motan and I really enjoyed, I enjoyed yep. how he was. I really he did. Was great. Yeah. yeah. So from what I understand is he does have, he is still taking clients. I've had clients um, with him in the past six months. They've been on a list and just called. So I don't know how quickly you can get in or not. It's COVID. So maybe a little bit more easily now. But I know he is still taking clients at the Royal Alec and um, doing IVF there. Interesting. Well, thank you guys for that update. And I am going to do my research as well. There's so much <laughs> that happens here on site at the Alex that I, in two years, I've probably learned something new every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry that I don't know the answer, but I will find out. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, got a text from one of my friends who was watching tonight. She literally just got her call for the fertility clinic for, uh, she got it today and she's oh. there in November. So, wow. Wanna, 
all of the good vibes. Take all okay. the good vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Is that the start of her journey then? Yes. Michelle, at the clinic? Yes, yeah. 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 So cross all of the things for her. For sure. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Very all cool. right. I'm going to wrap up guys. I'm going to be sending out okay. a follow-up email to everybody that was uh, registered today and asking for feedback. So I will be sure to share that with you guys once I get any feedback. And again, awesome. I just want to say thank you to all of you guys for your time and effort. And to the speakers, I will see you guys on Monday, hopefully, if you're home when I make my deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Amber. This Thanks, is great. Amber. Yeah, if, um, when you get it up on YouTube, uh, can you send us an email? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. That would be great. I already have a couple people asking about it. So I want to see <laughs> it. Yeah, for sure. Six or seven emails throughout the presentation as well that they were having issues connecting. So I will be sure to um, share that. Um, I said it's really next week. So perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank awesome. you so much. Of course. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, ladies. You as well. You as well. Both oh, all of you. Thank you so yeah. much. We can relax now. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Right. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Take care. Thank you.